Uh, good morning, good day, good evening, everyone. And allow me to welcome you to today's webinar that is being conducted to appreciate the WHO World Safety Day 2022. And we have a wonderful array of speakers representing IOMP, WHO, and also patient advocacy groups representatives. Objectives of the WHO World Patient Safety Day 2022 include raising global awareness of the high burden of medication related harm and advocating urgent action to improve medication safety, engaging key stakeholders and partners in the efforts to prevent medication errors, empowering patients and families to be actively involved in the safe use of medication. And lastly, scaling up implementation of WHO Global Patient Safety Challenge, Medication Without Harm. And we can say that use of ionizing radiation for diagnosis and therapeutic purposes also come under the principles of medication without harm. Our first speaker representing IOMP is Professor John Damilakis, who is a professor and chairman at the Department of Medical Physics School of Medicine, University of Crete. And he is also the current president of the International Organization for Medical Physics and PRAS president of the European Alliance for Medical Radiation Protection Research. He's also a member of the ICRP Committee 3 and member of the steering committee of the Eurosafe Imaging Campaign. John is highly esteemed clinically and research-wise and is uh, well known in our medical physics, imaging and radiation protection community. And he will start the today's debate with his talk on the medical physicist's impact on patient safety. Over to you, John. Thank you, Eva. Uh, let me share my screen. So I hope you see my screen now. Yes. And can you see the first slide? Yes, we can. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, for your uh, introduction. So hello everyone from the, from the beautiful city of Santiago de Compostela. I'm here in, in Spain for some lectures and uh, now I have another beauty to describe our role in patient radiation safety. Uh, radiation and equipment based on radiation are powerful tools that if used correctly can diagnose or treat diseases. If used incorrectly, there is potential to cause great harm uh, to people who undergo the examinations. So in today's webinar, I'll highlight medical physics' great contribution to patient radiation safety. There are many actions that medical physicists take to contribute to patient radiation safety. And this slide shows six specific medical physics actions that improve patient safety within the healthcare system. So medical physicists measure and evaluate the dose to the patient, radiation dose to the patient. We optimize the radiation protection of patients, support the justification of examinations by providing dose and risk information to ensure that the, the diagnosis of treatment is most effective, is the safe choice for the patients. Medical physicists are responsible for the quality assurance of the radiological equipment. We analyze events involving or potentially involving accidental exposures. And also medical physicists are sharing those and radiogenic risk information with patients and physicians. Most medical physicists focus their activities either on imaging or on radiation oncology. The role of medical physicists in radiation oncology is obvious, I think. Everybody can understand 
that modern radiotherapy is not possible without treatment planning, without monitoring patients' treatment, treatments throughout the course of therapy, or without measuring every day the performance of a linear accelerator. Uh, this slide shows some of the responsibilities of radiation oncology physics. They are highlight situation in which medical physics are able to impact patient safety in areas other than radiation therapy, in areas where our contribution is not so obvious by describing three scenarios. First scenario, a 16-year-old male with severe traumatic brain injury is subjected to a computer tomography scan after an accident. The neurosurgeon who knows that the patient will undergo extensive X-ray studies during his evaluation, hospitalization, and clinical follow-up is worried about patient's radiation exposure. Patients with traumatic brain injury undergo extensive uh, CT studies and other, other X-ray studies, perhaps. And the median number of CT examinations received by each patient during the first 12 months after injury was 20, according to this study published in AJR. What are the medical physics actions? First, the medical phys physicist will obtain patients' exam data. Medical physicists have developed many methods over the years to calculate doses. So the next action is to use the most accurate method, the most accurate patient dosimetry method to calculate patients' organ and tissue doses. Meetings with radiologists and the referring physician are also essential to discuss this specific patient case. To reduce cumulative dose from recurrent imaging, the medical physicist will propose low dose protocol, protocols. Eye lenses are among the most radiosensitive organs and may be considered at risk, especially in cases of repeated exposures during a short period of time. During the optimization process, the medical physicist will take this into consideration to, to, to reduce the dose to the patient's eyes. What are the results and the impact of medical physicist actions on the patient and health care system in this uh, uh, case? First, patient radiation uh, protection goals have been achieved. Estimating patient exposure strengthens the justification and optimization process. Actually, the symmetry is the pillar of justification and optimization. Decreased radiogenic risk. When a patient undergoes high dose imaging procedures, some organs receive high doses in the range where research shows that there is increased probability of carcinogenesis and increased awareness level. We have the knowledge to provide relevant information to radiologists, referring physicians, and other members of the healthcare team. Second scenario. The municipality of Crete is interested in CT lung cancer screening. They ask the university hospital to compile and undertake a study to compare benefits and risks, taking into consideration local conditions, develop low dose CT protocols, and answer questions such as who should be screened for lung cancer. In the island of Crete, there is a university hospital and three large public general hospitals in different geographical areas, shown in this slide here, the, the blue dots. Uh, the medical physics department of the university hospital will obtain detailed data related to city equipment of the hospitals, cooperate with radiologists, select the proper city units, develop low dose chest city protocols for screening, compare doses and risks, and perform a study to answer questions such as who should be screened for, long, uh, for lung cancer. As you and I know, expected benefits should be weighed against potential risks, and if benefits outweigh risks, the examination is justified. To provide an answer to the, to the uh, municipality, medical physicists need to balance 
benefits and risks. The benefit in this case is the number of cancers detected by CT screening, and this is easily calculated. Radiogenic risk is the number of excess cancers in a population exposed to radiation. In my opinion, the most realistic approach to the risk estimation issue, issue is accurate dosimetry and use of risk coefficients derived from studies of the atomic bomb survivors, radiotherapy patients, and so on. And we now have patient-specific and equipment-specific methods, uh, individualized dosimetry to produce 3D dose distributions and estimate organ and tissue doses from CT. Those calculation tools are available. CTRAT has been developed in my department for calculation of organ doses from chest CT examinations and for radiogenic risk estimation. This is a uh, web-based tool freely available and provides a detailed dose and risk report. Using accurate dose estimates and risk coefficients provided by the ICRP or BAIR-7, medical physicists will estimate the, the radiogenic risks associated with uh, CT screening. And the question is, what are the results and the impact of medical physics actions? We, first of all, we contributed to early lung cancer diagnosis. We achieved patient radiation protection goals. Radiogenic cancer risk is reduced for thousands of people, most of them healthy, who are going to be included in the CT screening program. Last scenario, scenario number three, a 30 year old female patient underwent a kyphoplastic procedure. And after the procedure, the patient was diagnosed as pregnant. Do we recommend abortion? The patient and her physician are very worried about embryo dose and embryo, embryo <laughs> risks. A risk actions of the medical physicist to analyze the events. The medical physicist should obtain patient's exam data. The most important action is to uh, calculate embryo dose. Results should be shared with radiologists and clinicians. And the fate of a human life, the life of the embryo, depends on these discussions. We have found that the dose to the conceptus from kyphoplasty procedures is very low, lower than four milligram, provided that the conceptus lies outside the primarily irradiated area. However, the, the dose can exceed 100 milligram when the conceptus is primarily irradiated. This means that the dose to the embryo depends mainly on the area of the treatment, the, the, the level of the, the, the spinal level. The medical physicist should recreate the event. So accurate dosimetry based on patient specific examination data is needed. And, and one of the tools we have developed and we can be found in, in, in this address here uh, is code, a tool for the estimation of conceptus dose from various uh, procedures, including CT and uh, including fluoroscopically guided procedures. You will find four medical dosimetry uh, tools uh, on this web page. And I'd like to stress that all of all these tools are freely available. In this case, a risk communication is the, the key to success. It's very, very important. So the medical physicist uh, should share a dose report with the radiologist and the surgeon, including information presented in, in this uh, slide. Results and impact. The medical physicist contributed significantly to the analysis of the event. This analysis will provide information about the cause of the incident and will possibly prevent the event from happening again. An unnecessary abortion due to radiation will be avoided thanks to medical physicist action. Is there something more important than, than uh, saving a human life? The pregnant patient is always anxious. Uh, she feels sometimes guilty. 
uh, questions such as what is the dose received by, by my baby? What are the risks? Need an answer. And providing clear information uh, is the only way to satisfy the patient. The medical physicist is the professional who will discuss uh, with uh, radiologists and referring physicians to inform them about the event, about the embryo doses, about the risks. These real world examples of patients or individuals who are safer because a medical physicist was involved in their care provide only a small glimpse of the patient, of the patient, patient care that nearly 30,000 medical physicists, globally we are about 30,000 uh, medical physicists uh, in the world uh, provide every day. So thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. Uh, thank you, John, kindly for such a fantastic explanation of the role that medical physicists play in patient safety. Uh, we will have a question and answer sessions after all three speakers will deliver their presentations. So may I please kindly ask you to type your questions into the Q&A tab in your, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Sure. Uh, I will start sharing screen now. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Emily van de Venter, who is the head of the Radiation and Health Unit at the World Health Organization. This program covers the public health aspects of both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation safety and provides information and guidance to national authorities on radiation protection and health. Emily is responsible for the WHO International EMF Project, the Global UV Project and Radon Activities. Uh, Dr. Van de Venter will be presenting a talk on patient safety from a WHO perspective. Emily, over to you. You can now share screen, please, and unmute yourself. Hello. So can you see my screen? Not yet. OK, yes, we can see your screen now, one of your screens. Excellent. We can see your first slide. Thank you. Excellent. Well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you about a topic of great importance to WHO, uh, and that is patient safety, of course. And I have to say that it's a real pleasure to speak to this activity with your organization, uh, which collaborates so closely and effectively uh, with, uh, uh, with WHO in, uh, in, uh, as being an NGO in official relations with WHO. So uh, my name is Emily van Deventer, and as was mentioned, uh, I work in the Radiation and Health Unit. But really, the topic of today's talk is very much related to the work of another department and division in WHO. And the responsible officer for patient safety is Dr. Nilam Dingra Kumar. And you may be able to reach her with her uh, uh, email address mentioned here. So this being said, and I think you all know very well the World Health Organization, but just to remind you that uh, we have been established, next year will be 75 years ago. And our main function is to deal from a United Nations agency uh, perspective on international health work. And our objective is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. And what is health for us? Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. This definition was in the constitution of 1948 and has never been changed. Our current program of work 
is very much uh, uh, around three poles of action. The first is to advance universal health coverage. The second to address health emergencies. And the third to promote healthier populations. These are attached to this triple billion goal that I, you see on the screen with 1 billion more people benefiting from universal health coverage, 1 billion people better protected from health emergencies, and 1 billion more people enjoying better health. This, uh, these goals seemed very lofty when we put them out in 2019, but you can imagine even within this uh, uh, situation that we have faced over the past couple of years, that we have definitely touched more than a billion people with our collective actions. Now, talking about patient safety, what is patient safety? It is defined by WHO as a framework of organized activities that may include cultural activities, specific uh, processes, procedures, behaviors, so that you would have an environment in healthcare that is consistently and sustainably lowering risks for the patients. Also reducing the occurrence of avoidable harm and trying to make errors less likely. Why do we care about this? Well, because patient safety is a huge public health challenge and it's one of the leading causes of death and disability around the world. Now, if you look at the numbers, one in 10 patients is subject to an adverse event while in the hospital, and this is in high-income countries. In low-income countries, you have around 134 million adverse events due to unsafe care in hospitals. That means around 2.6 million deaths every year due to the problems around patient safety. And the social cost of this is huge. It goes from 1 trillion to 2 trillion per year in US dollars. So you can understand why this has been uh, uh, mentioned as a priority for WHO. And recognizing that improving and ensuring patient safety is a growing challenge both to health service delivery globally and uh, uh, um, in 2019, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution on global action on patient safety. And they urged the member states to recognize that patient safety is a global public health problem. And doing so, they formulated a global patient action, safety action plan. And this action plan was to be aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals. In these discussions, what was also established is this annual World Patient Safety Day on September 17 every year. So this year it happens to be on Saturday and we are very pleased to having a series of different activities around it, including this very webinar. So the World Health Assembly decision also has mandated WHO to report back on the progress in the implementation of the action plan uh, to the Assembly in 2023, so next year, and after that every two years until 2031. So we need to show results. Member states need to show results. Everybody needs to show results. Uh, so it is really very apt to discuss with you and present to you now the Global Patient Safety Action Plan 2021 to 2030. And you can find the whole document, which is about 100 pages, on the WHO website. Now, the purpose of this Global Action Plan was first to provide a strategic directions for all the stakeholders, and they are quite a few, um, to develop certain policies, certain actions related to patient safety, and also to provide a framework so that at national level and in bigger countries, even maybe at sub-national level, you could develop an action plan on patient safety. Also to align 
whatever existing instruments you already have and in that way to promote patient safety in all uh, clinical and health related programs. And finally, to provide guidance on the implementation of this action plan. So the vision here is a world in which no one is harmed in healthcare and every patient will receive safe and respectful care every time, everywhere. And the goal was de uh, developed as to achieve the maximum possible reduction in avoidable harm due to unsafe healthcare globally. So the mission throughout this work is to drive forward policies, strategies, different actions that are based on science, but also on patient experience, on the health system design, and very much on partnerships so that we can eliminate all sources of avoidable risk and harm to patients, but also to health workers. So there are a number of uh, guiding principles, actually seven guiding principles that underpin the values that were used to develop this uh, global action plan. And the first one is to engage the families and the patients as partners in this work, to re achieve results through collaborating, uh, collaborative working, and I will mention that a little bit more uh, in the next few slides, to use the data that we have to be able to analyze this data, to learn from it, and to translate the evidence into actions, to base our policies on the nature of the care uh, setting. So whether you are in a primary hospital or in a tertiary one. Now also to use scientific expertise, but also as mentioned, patient experience. And this will help to instill a safety culture in the delivery of, uh, of a, a, a system with no patient harm. Now, the motto here is very much patient safety is everybody's business. And so who are the partners in action here? We have governments, of course, ministries of health, the executive agencies, uh, legislative institutions, other maybe concerned ministries, regulatory bodies. In terms of healthcare facilities and services, all of them should uh, work on patient safety. And this is ranging from pri primary health centers to large teaching hospitals. We have other stakeholders that need to be involved, such as NGOs like yours, patient, patient organizations, professional bodies, scientific associations, uh, of course, academic and research institutions. Um, and finally, the WHO Secretariat is very much part of this uh, work. And that means WHO at all three levels, in the country offices, in the regional offices, and at headquarters. So the, uh, the, uh, the main part of this document is related to the seven strategic objectives that you see on the screen now. And the action plan is constructed on uh, uh, the first uh, strategic objective, relating to making zero avoidable harm to patients a state of mind in the planning and the delivery of healthcare everywhere, whether it's at national or at subnational level. The second objective is to build high reliability health systems and health organization that will protect patients daily from harm. SO3, strategic objective number three, is to assure the safety of every clinical process. And you have heard about in the context of your work, what type of clinical process you do and how that can be uh, further uh, helping towards uh, patient safety. The uh, strategic objective number four is about engaging and empowering the patients and their family to help the, uh, the journey to safer healthcare. This, uh, strategic objective number five is to inspire, educate, and protect every health worker to contribute 
to the design and delivery of uh, a safer healthcare system. And this is, of course, very much along your area of work. SO6 is ensuring a constant flow of information and knowledge to reduce an uh, avoidable harm. And strategic objective number seven is about developing and sustaining multi-sectoral and multinational synergy, partnership, and solidarity. So you can see that just looking at these seven strategic objectives, this is already a very rich plan, but here you see that each of these seven objectives is achieved through another 35 specific strategies. So at the end of the day, you really have a seven by five matrix, as we call it. And for each of these actions, you will have specific strategies for the four key groups of partners that I mentioned before, the governments, the healthcare facilities and services, the stakeholders and the WHO secretariat. So obviously I cannot go through every steps here, but I just wanted to highlight one, for example, strategic objective number five, which was on health worker education, skills and safety. And I consider this webinar as part of it. You will see that in this topic, you have already five strategies to handle. And in each one of them, there will be several actions for the healthcare workers. Now, patient safety in healthcare, we, uh, uh, we saw it as a subject of international focus since about the early 2000s, and where it was started to be considered as a serious global concern. And so in about uh, 2015, I guess, the United Kingdom's uh, Department of Health and the German Federal uh, Ministry of, of Health joined efforts to initiate a series of annual global ministerial summits dedicated to patient safety. And the idea here was to bring together international experts, political decision makers, and healthcare leaders. And so the first two uh, summits were held uh, in London and in Bonn, and uh, thereafter uh, in Tokyo and Jeddah. In the last one was in 2019. Uh, and this very much helped to, uh, to work on this WHA resolution, which I mentioned at the beginning. And the plans for 2020 were, of course, derailed by COVID. But I'm happy to say that the next ministerial uh, uh, summit will be held in uh, uh, Switzerland, in Montreux, next February. Um, and I just wanted to... Uh, spend the next uh, couple of minutes to mention the World Patient Safety Day, which is uh, uh, um, very much the idea behind it is to raise global awareness on patient safety issue and uh, everybody can participate. Patients, families, professional associations, and this year's topic and theme was medication safety, medication without harm. Uh, the idea behind it was uh, launched already in 2017. Mm -hmm. And so you can look on the web uh, uh, about more uh, on this topic. But finally, I wanted to mention that this is an ongoing challenge that is uh, 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 continuing uh, um, and we need your help in this area. The activities in September are many, and you can uh, uh, find a number of teaching and technical resources uh, on our website, um, campaign materials, and from a radiation protection perspective, this uh, action plan very much includes radiation protection of both patients and workers, and uh, it is very much, uh, patient safety has a central role in radiation safety programs. So finally, in terms of radiation related webinars, besides the one that we are in today, there will be another one by ISRRT tomorrow. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, Emily, thank you, thank you so much. And it's wonderful to see that an organization such as WHO really takes the patient safety very seriously. 
I will share my screen for the last time. Okay. And we have heard in this presentation from medical physicists, from a representative of WHO, but it is very important to have an all-rounded discussion and making sure that we also have a representative of, of our patients group. So it is my pleasure to welcome to the panel, Dr. Eric Briers, who will talk on radiation without harm from the patient's perspective. Eric holds a doctorate in chemistry from University of Leuven in Belgium, and he was the executive director of the European Cancer Patient Coalition and an interim executive director of the European Platform for Patient Organization Science and Industry. He was also active at the European Medicine Agency, at the Patient and Consumer Working Party, and later was appointed by the EU Commission as an alternate patient member of the Committee on Advanced Therapies. Eric, welcome to the panel. Can I please ask you to share your screen and deliver your talk? We can see your screen. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. This is, of course, for patients, a very important aspect to be uh, safe in the hands of our medical profession who will take care of us. The objective is always to, to get a cure and not to have worse problems. Now, from our perspective, we also know, well, not everyone, but I know that there's, of course, more than medical radiation that comes to us. There's also this background, and the background is worldwide very diverse and ranges from perhaps 1 to 10 millisievert per year, and an average could be 2.4 to 2.6 millisievert per year. This is a background which we cannot change, and unless we want to move, and in Europe we could go to the United Kingdom, where the level is quite lower than in Finland. But this background radiation also is a source of carcinogenesis. So we can get a cancer from our background radiation, although it is low, it still can do that. But also, and this is then on a uh, very, very long time scale, is that uh, this background irradiation and exposure is a driver of mutations and of evolution of species. So it is not only dangerous for us now, but it, if you look over millennia, it has been a part of perhaps creating us. Now, if we look at medical exposure, this medical exposure for persons is, of course, depending on what is going on with him. Some persons have zero uh, excess radiation exposure because they have nothing medical going on. And this can happen for years in a row. But some do have it. And it has been calculated that there is something like a 0.36 average millisievert per year added to the background. And this is about 14% of the yearly uh, exposure to radiation. This is not zero, so it has to be used in a very judicious way. And this brings us then to the radiation without harm. And we have heard that what medical safety is referred to by the World Health Organization. And we know that this safety is also in the use of medical devices has to be done in a very safe way. There are diagnostic processes and they not even necessarily are in contact with the patient. A blood test needs to be well done because the results can lead to harm for the patient. So it is a very wide concept and it has to be um, obeyed or followed in all these possible instances where patients and the medical profession, medical professionals come into contact with each other. Now, if you look at the patient side, the patients, they are entitled to know and understand the consequences of medical treatments and procedures that they will undergo. This is a tall order because the general public, and we've seen that on a 
previous slide, there is no level of knowledge of potential risk of radiation, of ionizing radiation, that is not present in the general public. A lot of people really do have no idea of what the potential risks are. It's important, potential risks. We can also wonder if there would be a level of exposure, supplementary exposure, below which it is ethically okay not to communicate with the patients. And I think we can agree that there is such a level, but even at such a low level, if the patient wants to know more, he is entitled, even with very low doses, to be informed by the clinician, by the medical physicist, or whoever is involved in his procedure. If we look at the radiation by itself, so the ionizing radiation, this is, from the patient's perspective, very different. We have the high dose and high energies, and this is used in the radiation treatments. We can have photons, we can have alpha beta particles, protons, even carbon ions are used to treat patients. And this is a big difference from the low dose and low energy radiation used for diagnostic purposes. But of course, accumulation of low doses can also increase the problem, potential risk for secondary tumors as, and we are very wary of that, in children. Now we have also patients who come for a treatment or for a diagnosis, but there's another group which was also mentioned by John. They are not patients, they are what we call apparently healthy individuals. And we want to screen them using ionizing radiation to detect perhaps a cancer. In the past, it was used to detect in children whether or not they had tuberculosis. So these groups are different and the approach should be different too. Now in radiation treatment, we all know that radiation treatment comes with severe side effects. But the risk of the treatment, so the side effects, is offset by the benefit of the treatment. And the benefit is potentially, for instance, a cure or that the pain goes away. But sometimes we have alternate possibilities like surgery or radiation therapy in localized tumors. But in that case, the patient can choose for the lowest risk, but he can choose according to his own information and in agreement with his clinician. Now in radiation treatment, it is targeting that is the key of everything because as you well know, radiation will not only hit the tumor, for instance, but also healthy tissue around it. And we have to limit the size, the, the width of the beam to, and prevent it from touching healthy tissues. We don't want a patient with prostate cancer, for instance, to have urinary problems, to have bowel problems or whatever is possible. There is then also internal radiation in which case there is less damage to the surrounding tissue, but still the, the seeds that bring in the radiation have to be placed very meticulously. And then lastly, we have today new approaches with uh, radionuclides in which there is a hyperfine targeting with antibodies or other molecules to hit the cancer tissue and then to bring with these molecules the radio label to the cancer directly. But even here we have alpha or beta particles. They are very high energy. They have a very short range, but still they can cause side effects. If for instance, the bone marrow is area is radiated because it's a bone tumor we are treating. Then in diagnosis, this of course is a situation where the patient has a problem, perhaps a broken arm, and the imaging procedure will dissolve this saying, this is the question, it is a simple cask is okay, or we would need to put screws in the arm to fix it, whatever is necessary. So here again, Sometimes there is a discussion 
is there an other alternative, a non-radiative alternative like an MRI? If that exists with same diagnostic efficacy and available, then that should be used. Also important for patients. But if the efficacy is not sufficient, then there is a question, of course, of should we use that? And one of these brings us to one of the initiatives of the European Society of Radiology. One of their safety projects is the use of shielding. There has been for many, many years a use of applying shielding in radio, radiological procedures, but recent knowledge has brought that it is hardly ever necessary. So there is a new European consensus published in 21, and we are now, there's work done to roll it out over Europe so that patients are confident that there is no shielding when not necessary, but it requires a lot of uh, information and communication with the patient. Okay, then let's go to this special case of uh, applying ionizing radiation procedures on healthy persons. And healthy persons, for them, the discussion on benefit and risk is even higher and more important. I will go into the example of breast cancer. We already got the example of lung cancer. In what is the risk of a mammography? The risk is, of course, exposure to this ionizing radiation. It could cause a secondary cancer, and there have been lots of discussions among patients whether or not we should expose uh, healthy women to this potential risk. The cumulative dose is in play because we want these women to come back regularly for a new uh, screening process, but the risk in general calculated over all these years is low. So it's something that happens rarely. But on the other hand, what is very important, of course, is that we get the possibility to detect a cancer in a very early stage. If we don't do the procedure, there is no radiation risk, but we will not potentially detect a lethal cancer. And we will only detect it when it is in a metastasized stage because of pain or other symptoms that are caused by this kind of cancers. Now, will we use this radiation on the patient? We will have to evaluate this. And there are two kinds of evaluation. John gave the evaluation on the more national level, but we can also look what it is for the individual patient. So the individual patient, the woman has to decide, will I, yes or no, submit myself to a mammography? If she accepts the risk at the left side, she has two options. She does or she does not. If she does not, that's fine. It's her decision, so no exposure to uh, radiation, but of course, the uncertainty about the presence of a cancer is still there and will not be resolved. If she accepts the procedure, there are two possible outcomes. There is a negative outcome, then there will be no treatment, and the benefit is then, yes, there's no cancer detection yet, which means that the patient will have to come back for another round of screening. If the patient, the, if the person accepts the procedure, and it is positive, then they could follow biopsies and if needed treatment. And the benefit of course is a potential cure and a better quality of life. But if the answer is negative, it is possible that the tumor present in the breast is so small that it is not detected yet, which means that is a false, false negative that's under diagnosis, under treatment. On the other hand, if it's positive and there's a biopsy and perhaps a treatment, this could be a false positive. And this is overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And this is also something that in the procedure needs to be balanced out. The possibility of false negatives and of false positives. So it is a very delicate issue to submit 
healthy persons to a screening process involving ionizing radiation. And today this discussion will come up because the European Commission in the cancer beating plan will promote or advise countries to start with a lung cancer screening, prostate cancer screening, but also throat screening. So this discussion will have to be done by all the stakeholders. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric. And I would like everyone to join me in thanking our three wonderful speakers, uh, Emily, John and Eric. Uh, we have received a number of questions in the chat. And uh, maybe, John, I will start with you. What is the best way to communicate risks to patients? Uh, that's that's, uh, that's, that's an important tough one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 medical physicists, is the question about medical physicists communicating uh, risks or in general? Medical physicists or clinicians in general. Okay, uh, because this is important. I believe that medical physicists should not normally, of course there are exceptions, but should not normally communicate risks directly uh, to patients. Uh, so uh, I believe that our role is to share our knowledge with referring physicians, radiologists, and uh, they uh, will discuss with patients and patients uh, will take the final decision. So this is the, uh, the normal uh, flow of uh, actions in my opinion. Okay. Do you feel that it's very important to also train clinicians, and Eric might want to answer as well, to be able to communicate risks in a, at a level that's un easily understood by patients? Because, you know, radiation risk can be quite complicated. Definitely. Uh, th this is actually our, one of our uh, responsibilities. And uh, according to the European Union BSS, Basic Safety Standards, uh, uh, there is a, for the very first time, the, the, the last uh, directive, the Euratom directive, uh, devotes an article on the roles and responsibilities of medical physicists. So there is a list of responsibilities, one of them, to contribute to the education of medical, of uh, referring physicians and radiologists uh, and healthcare personnel in general uh, in uh, uh, matters related to radiation. Um, yeah, so the answer, Eric, my answer is yes. Yes, Eric, would you like to add anything uh, from um, the patient perspective? Yes, um, it is not, as I said, not every patient will ask questions about the uh, yeah. safety of the procedure that he's undergoing, which could be much more than just the radiation aspect. But it's important that when a patient has questions, that there is someone who is willing, capable and trained to answer these questions. And he will have to be able to do this at different levels of the patients. Mm -hmm. Not all patients have a PhD, so exactly. most don't. And they all have a right to understand what the risks are. And this it's quite challenging, but Absolutely. it's needed. And we, we would prefer to see what we call the radiologist on call, who is available to answer the questions. So not just radiation safety, but also on the procedures in general. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Emily, are you available? Can you unmute yourself? Sure. Yeah. Emily, what would be the best approach to put patient safety as a priority in hospitals in countries with limited resources and therefore maybe limited leadership, financial and human resources? And how can WHO support these initiatives? Uh, this is a very good question, Eva. Uh, I don't know who put it uh, up, but uh, the, the thing is, of course, that we realize um, that uh, the different countries are at different stages in creating the capacity 
uh, to reduce preventable uh, patient harm. And uh, so what we uh, consider through this uh, global action plan is first to do a landscape assessment, you know, to, to look at the baseline to see what are the major uh, safety risks and the barriers to improvement in the country, whether you are a high income country or a low or middle income country, and then to really to push for a strong uh, political and organizational leadership on this topic. And this can be done in any country, but you need to have the will at the national level for this. Um, and um, then there are in the, in the action plan, there is actually a number of indicators that countries can look at to measure themselves over the years. And in you know, year zero, you, you know what you have, but then every year you will try to improve on this at your hospital level, at your region, uh, regional level, or at the national level. And uh, one example that they have as an indicator is uh, the, uh, to, uh, to see how, how many uh, more um, uh, regions, let's say, have incorporated a patient safety curriculum in the education program for healthcare professionals. So in the context of medical physics, you can really measure this. You know, uh, uh, do you have more courses, educational programs on patient safety? Mm -hmm. So these John, are some would, examples. Yeah, John, would you like to add anything on the role on IOMP to in assisting the low to middle income countries? This is one of the, of the main roles of IOMP, obviously. And we support this by many different ways, uh, by supporting education, by supporting research. Uh, one, uh, uh, this webinar is <laughs> uh, devoted uh, on, on patient safety. And uh, we are open also for uh, any um, proposals. Uh, or suggestions by, uh, especially uh, by by the uh, international organizations such as WHO or IAA, and uh, of course uh, patients. Uh, uh, medical physicists do not uh, very frequently talk to patients uh, because mm -hmm. we are be behind the scenes. <laughs> That's yeah. uh, patients don't know, for example, that medical yeah. physicists uh, in, in radiation therapy. It is so important, the role of medical physicists. And if you ask 100 patients, 90% uh, will uh, don't even know the role of medical, yeah. don't, don't know that medical physicists exist, that they have planned their treatment. <laughs> uh, their, their, their health depends on medical physicists. So uh, yeah, this is another point, of course, uh, the, the, but okay. This is another, another, another note on, on another note. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. We, yeah. Eric, uh, yeah. Yeah. Eric, do we do enough? You know, we always talk about risk estimates, but do we do enough in quantifying the benefits so that we can really put forward very objective cost benefit analysis, if I can use that term? Yeah. Well, it, it is, uh, it's not always easy, but the benefits, it depends if the patient, if it's a patient who has a, a disease and who went to the hospital or to the doctor with that problem, it, it should be easy to explain the benefits because the objective is a cure or a stabilization of his condition. And that is a, uh, has an influence on his quality of life. And today patients, they, rather talk and would like to talk about quality of life and maintaining yes. that quality of life instead of just life. Surviving, yeah. Because a life without quality is not really what we want. And, uh, but I'm from the cancer field and in the cancer field, these discussions are at this moment quite let, they are done and there is a high view on, there is a double, few on benefit. One is the benefit of curing, of progression-free survival. 
But the other one is also to minimize the risks. So we could favor a treatment that has perhaps less overall survival, but a better quality of life. So the discussion is not so simple. And this also yeah. goes on to radiation treatment. So we know that we want to cure the patient or we want to take away the pain, but then for how long? How far can we go in, in doing this? Because at the end, there will be harm. Yes. So it really should be in the end also up to the patient to make the decision what's the main priority for them. Together yeah. with the clinician, of course, because the clinician knows better the real in and outs. The patient yeah. has to try to understand what am I told and how can I see this? And then they should together come to a sort of consensus decision. And then the patient has to let go. He can go to 17 other oncologists, but yeah. he will have to put his faith in one and yeah. say, okay, now you go I'm and you do what, what yeah. we agreed. Emily, you have given us a very good showcase of WHO uh, program in the area of patient safety. Uh, is the program prioritized in any way? Are any of those steps higher on the hierarchical ladder than the others? What is the first thing you would like to achieve? Uh... I don't think there is a prioritization in the different actions in this plan. Uh, you saw it's a pretty broad plan with uh, 35 different strategic directions. Um, so they are all important. However, I would like to uh, bring your attention to the chapter on monitoring and reporting, because at the national level or at the hospital level, it shows you what type of indicators we're looking for. And that is very important for you to be able to, uh, to prioritize in your institution or in your area of work, what you can do towards patient safety. Mm -hmm. Uh, should new programs, new technologies, whether in therapy or diagnosis, be independently audited when they are implemented in hospitals? Is this for I'm opening it to any of you who wants to start. Oh. I, I believe in the independent audits because it adds another level of independent scrutiny. John, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah, I would. Uh... Very, uh, my short answer is why not? Why not? Uh, yes, I'm in favor of uh, independent audits, especially for, for new technologies, exactly. either in diagnosis or, diagnosis or in therapy. Yeah, I, I agree. You need both. You need your internal permanent quality assurance so that your internal services know everything is well, it's running according to procedures and et cetera but occasionally you will need an external audit of the internal audit with the possibility to go very deep. And that's the best way so that all systems in the country come to the same very high level of security and of safety. Now, uh, uh, we'll have to finish in the interest of time, so maybe just one last question. This was raised, I believe, in the previous webinars. Should the radiation dose received by patients during various examinations and treatments throughout their life be recorded in the electronic patient record so that we can more easily estimate overall risk? Maybe Eric, I will start with you. <laughs> um, well, you can note it. I have absolutely no problem with that. And it may be used later if something has to be decided whether or not an extra dose can be used. But we have to look on the other side that the patient will only, the question on an extra dose treatment uh, diagnostic procedure will only come if there's a new event in the patient's life. And we cannot say, oh, now he has another tumor, but he had so much radiation, so we are not going to do the procedure. What are you going to do then? So. The, the benefit risk at that moment is if we don't use an extra dose of radiation, we will uh, uh, abandon this patient and we will not give him a, a possibility to survive this new event. Emily, what's the WHO opinion about having like a electronic record 
of all patient doses? I, I think this is a, this is a cherry on the cake in a way because yes. I suppose that many countries will not be able to do this. Do so, of yeah. course, it is something to look forward to, but uh, it's not uh, it's not something we can hope for in a num in a large number of countries at this stage. Yeah, John. Uh, actually, patient dose is recorded in electronic medical records or uh, records of uh, hospitals, uh, at least some indices. For example, some people think that uh, only images, for example, a, a CT examination consists of uh, uh, only images, but uh, there are also DICOM metadata and uh, CTDI, for example, uh, or dose length product or other indices. Uh, for other modalities, um, uh, our information about the, those indices uh, is included uh, in, in uh, patient records, patients' records, and in the uh, electronic uh, systems of, of at least of big hospitals. Uh, of course, we need to do that in a systematic way using mm. those management systems, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, and I, I believe that this is a very useful, but unfortunately, it's still expensive uh, system. So many uh, hospitals cannot afford, afford it. Emily, have you had experience? I still will have one question. And this may be the role of medical physicists who maybe identify some deficiencies in their practice and they want to improve the processes, protocols, quality assurance, but the management will not listen because it might have cost implications or human resource implications. How do we engage the managers of hospitals to have buy-in in supporting patient safety initiatives, even if it means that we have to hire more staff and more QA equipment? Well, I think this is where you uh, you uh, print out the the global patient safety action plan because it is uh, it's actually a very interesting document. And when looking at it, I thought that uh, it may be interesting in in the future to work with you as an organization and try to map out uh, the actions that. Uh, uh, an NGO like IOMP can do with respect to the different actions that are that are mentioned there. But uh, if you are working in a hospital as, as let's say a healthcare worker, there are a number of actions that are delineated just for your profession. So uh, uh, there is quite a bit in there that you can do as an individual discussing this with your uh, hospital management. Thank you. And I believe patient advocacy is important because patients that demand, say, access to safe procedures should also keep uh, the health services managers accountable for provision of safe services. Yeah. Now, in the interest of time, uh, this is a fantastic discussion. Uh, I still have to finish. So, Firstly, I would like to thank and ask everyone to join me in thanking our wonderful speakers, Emily, Eric, and John for their fantastic presentations. And before I say final goodbyes, I would like to remind our participants that the next IOMP webinar will be held on uh, 19th of October, and it will be conducted in collaboration with International Federation of Biomedical Engineering, and it will be on management of biomedical equipment. Uh, we will post the details about presenters and abstract on the IOMP website as soon as possible. So hoping to see you all in about one month time. So once again, Emily, Eric, John, thank you very, very much for your presentations. Thank you, Eva. Thank, Thank you, Emily. You. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.